Um, Don Hyman's our president, um, president of our board. Um, so I'm going to ask Don just to, this is a, this is a total of about a five minute presentation. So um, we're going to keep it short and sweet so we can go on a hike. Um, but I'm going to ask Don to, to say a few brief words to the assembled audience. <laughs> well, uh, thank you once again for coming, and David and Alice and the others involved. Thank you very much for all that you've done to make this happen. Of course, Mrs. Donald, thank you so much for everything you've done to help. I think all of us here, without exception, share a love of open space, a love of forest and field and things. Uh, natural in the environment. It touches us in a special way. I was I came out of the YMCA yesterday after a workout and I saw a little kids four and five years old playing in the hedge in front of the Y. I bet you all had that moment when you were a small child and you went behind a hedge, a gigantic hedge, and, and you were hiding in there and you created your own little world of what it was like in this kind of musty smelling different place that you could hide in, and that, that might be your first contact with, with things natural, things wood-like, things silver. And I think we all had those moments, and when we're able to buy land like this, and keep land like this available for people to enjoy, we increase the chances of that happening to more kids in the future, more lawmakers, more people who can help us buy more land protect this beautiful space which is so special and, and valuable. Thank each of you for what you do uh, in words and deeds, your support, your, your efforts, your dollars, your good words. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Don. Very well said. Um, and I want to thank Barbara Belknap and the Belknap family, David, Thank you for hosting us this morning. Um, we're here to celebrate the acquisition of a 38-acre parcel that's connected to our Honey Hill Preserve that we're going to take a walk on. And uh, we worked with the Belknap family to preserve that. Um, they have a history of conservation uh, in the area, uh, including a preserve that bears their name right across the street um, that they work with the town of Wilton to preserve. And we're just very grateful that you have an ethic of, of open space and are willing to work with us to preserve the property. Uh, not everybody is, um, and we're very grateful for their support in, in, in helping to make it happen. Um, just a, a, a very brief overview, you know, this property was actually purchased by Barbara's dad, Chauncey Belknap, 90 years ago. Um, and there was only one other owner before the Belknaps, uh, is my understanding. Uh, which is the Sturgis family that, re that, that, that received the property in a land grant from the English monarchy. Um, and the Sturgises own many, 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 many acres here. Um, it's really some very interesting history. And, you know, it's not just the land, but people are really connected to the land. You know, there's always a person behind the land. Land doesn't preserve itself. People preserve land, which is, which is important. Um, and Chauncey, I believe, bought this property uh, as a getaway from New York City where he was a lawyer at a prestigious law firm. Um, and he had quite an interesting uh, life and story uh, himself. And I had a chance uh, to walk the property with Barbara's brother, Bob, a few times before he passed away. And he really loved this land. And I remember Bob telling me when he was a kid running around this property that there were no trees. <laughs> Because really? remember, there weren't any trees because it was all cut down for agriculture and trees to, that they used to burn to make charcoal. And so he had a lot of really interesting memories to tell. And it was really a pleasure to be able to walk this land with Bob. And um, I'd like to ask Barbara if she would like to say a few brief words about her family's history here. Oh, well, I'm glad you're all here. And originally, this when this property was a farm. They grew some corn in the field across the road, which won a prize at the Chicago Exposition of 1890-something or other. And uh, I think Wilbur Sturgis grew onions primarily. 
But then in, when you had the farm, you also had the land that was no good. You couldn't farm it. And uh, that's where you had trees because that was your woodlot. And it is the woodlot for this farm that you all purchased recently. Oh, uh, and, and that was the land that in those days was no good. Uh, I'm very happy, we all are, that it is good and that it is, has become part of the land that uh, Aspetuck is preserving. It, it was very much what our family wished. The members of my family that are here today are me and my nephew, Gilles Carter, and Debbie Carter, yes, there she is, my niece, <laughs> and my sister is, is She's well on the, on the porch. She's on the porch. Okay, my sister is sitting on the porch there. Uh, she will be celebrating her 91st birthday oh, this week. Wow. wow. Stop, and, stop and say hello to her as you walk by. <laughs> And uh, I hope you have a wonderful hike. We arranged the weather very carefully. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, Thank you. I think it's good. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so very briefly, um, you know, this property uh, that Aspetuck Land Trust purchased, the Belknap property as we call it, is, is right here. Um, and this is a key parcel you know, in our efforts to preserve 350 acres in what we're calling the Western Wilton Forest Block with the Wilton Land Conservation Trust. And Donna Merrill, the executive director of the, of the Wilton Land Trust, is here. Hi, Donna. And so Aspetuck Land Trust and Wilton Land Trust are working together to preserve the last remaining undeveloped parcels in this area. It's kind of tough to see what we're thinking about here, but all the yellow parcels are the parcels that we are trying to protect and we just protected this 38 acre piece. We purchased this piece in Wilton a few years ago. This is the Wilton, this is Weston. This is Devil's Den. Um, we're, we are uh, right now um, on Wampum Hill Road, about right here, we're right here, okay? And so we're looking at protecting the remaining yellow parcels, which will total out to about 350 acres, including this one and this one as well, and we're also working with the Nature Conservancy. Now you can kind of get a better sense of the blob, which is the forest block, which is right here. Um, so it's really an ecologically resilient landscape, which you may not know. Um, and we know it's ecologically resilient because of the mapping that the Highstead Foundation has done with Harvard Forest and the Nature Conservancy. It's important because this Belknap property, this forest block, is, is close to other protected lands. Um, over to, you can see right here, this is, this is the Belknap property here. And it's, it's, it's near the Devil's Den, which goes all the way through state land around the Saugatuck Reservoir, touches Trout Valley, our 1,009 acre property. So by preserving this area, this is our forest block, we can really create a protected open space almost the size of Trout Valley and Devil's Den. We talk about Devil's Den and Troutbrook being the lungs of Fairfield County. We're going to add a third lobe to the lung right here. <laughs> so it's pretty exciting. Uh, but there's good groundwater quality in the area. There, there, there are inland wetland soils and there's a lot of rivers and streams here. And where there's water, there's life. So it's a very important landscape from an ecological perspective. So if you can look at this big map here, this is the project area that we're working on here in Weston and Wilton where this forest block is. We're working on another one in Fairfield. This work is part of Aspetuck Land Trust's larger effort to create really a 17,000 acre green corridor through our four towns. And you can see the green corridor here and this green kind of hatch markings with two project areas where we're working to preserve some of the last large parcels. So we've got an effort here We've got an effort here, but it's part of a larger effort to preserve land in this green corridor. Um, we're not going to preserve all the land in the green corridor. Um, you can see some of the darker spots are properties that we already own. One of the, the, the two big things that we want to do through this 17,000 acre green corridor initiative is preserve the last large parcels, but we also want to work with homeowners, people that you know have two or three acre lots and houses and yards 
to encourage them to do things on their own yards that are good for the environment, that support the ecological health of the forest block, the town, and the region. Because remember, everything flows downhill, and there are things that people can do in their own yards. Remember, homeowners are really landowners. So in a sense, you can be your own land trust, right? By doing things that make sense ecologically in your own yard. Um, and I know our, some of our land trust members are already doing that. I met some wonderful folks from Easton um, who are inspiring their neighbors uh, to do this work. But we're gonna be moving on that vision and it's gonna take a good 10 plus years to do, but we're starting now. And um, this is our stake in the ground through this effort here and here and this larger green corridor initiative to really put open space back on the map again and get people excited about doing stuff in their own yards that is good for the environment. So um, to that end, we do have a very special guest here today, Mary Ellen LeMay, <laughs> who's gonna tell a story. Uh, I'll tell you a little story which I think illustrates the importance of doing things in your own yard in, in an ecological fashion. Um, and Mel's gonna talk to you about uh, a packet of information that we have and some pollinator plants that you can take home with you today. Uh, but this won't be the first time you hear from us. Uh, it won't be the last. We're going to keep moving this forward here in this area. Um, the Belknap property is one piece of the puzzle for us on the land acquisition front to preserve the 350 acres that we want to preserve to create this large forest block. But the ongoing work with homeowners will continue. Um, and Mel is going to talk just a little bit about that. Um, and then we're going we're gonna to go on a hike. Um, before we go on the hike, I will say right now, I want to thank Van Dusenberry, who is our trail steward here at the Honey Hill Preserve, uh, for all of his efforts to build the new trail, um, and also uh, as the coordinator of our 70 plus trail steward. So thank you, Van, for that. Yeah. Uh, and just so I don't forget, uh, Anthony Zemba is our ecologist that's going to be leading us on this hike today. Where is Anthony? Hey, Anthony. Um, he's, he is so knowledgeable and very familiar uh, with this land, so I'm really looking forward to, to his hike. He studied this area in depth um, as we had to write some grants to the state to support the acquisition of this Vilnap uh, parcel and um, Anthony was our person on the ground to make the case from an ecological perspective that this land was worth preserving. So with that, I'll just hand it over to Mel. Thank okay. you, Mel. Um, so uh, I am the facilitator for a conservation partnership, a regional conservation partnership called Hudson to Housatonic. So it kind of gives you a visual. It's, for short, we call it H2H. So it's the Housatonic River to the Hudson River, which is a big landscape, a very um, similar topography and we have a lot of uh, you know urban areas along the coast as they go up in the in the counties into more rural areas like this and as as our climate changes we need to help to create these corridors for species of wildlife even plants need to move to areas of that have a climate where they can continue to find food and forage for what they in order to survive um, when a, when a, a landscape is fragmented, it creates little pockets and the can't, species can't move and that creates extinction. So we're going to look at this positively and think we need to help to create these corridors. And when we have big pieces of land like this that are preserved, that's huge. But you have to look at the smaller pockets in between that are like the bridges between the big spaces. And those are our backyards. So what we do in our backyards impacts what can walk through in the corridors and what shows up. And um, it's called basically stewardship. So there's conservation, which is the purchase of conservation easements, and then there's stewardship, which is what we are going to do. And so um, this is a really unique opportunity that in the H2H corridor, in the H2H landscape, we're looking at as a model. So what's going to happen here with Aspatuck is going to be a model that can be replicated all through this region in Westchester County, in Putnam County. Um, and so the, the outreach to landowners, homeowners, um, is going to be really important. So um, this is why uh, Aspatuck is providing these little packets of native pollinator plants um, that you can each take home and you can make your own 
na nature preserve in your backyard. And you'll be amazed when you plant these what mm -hmm. will show up. Um, and I encourage you to take these packets with you too because this lists um, this initiative in this pollinator pathway which was started by uh, Donna Merrill uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in Wilton which was kind of ground zero for this pathway that is a connection for pollinators. And you can, um, see, no, yeah. sorry to interrupt, but you can see the pollinator pathway here, uh, which is essentially kind of a subset of the green corridor. Yes, yeah, and, and so it's a truly an informal pathway. So it can be going up the middle of uh, Main Street and Ridgefield. <coughs> and uh, it, it has taken off from one town to another uh, because it's something that homeowners can do. Um, and so if you grab this, you'll see that we've listed, uh, this is through the state of Connecticut, these are all native plants and when they bloom, so this way you'll have a continuous bloom for pollinators on your property. Um, so there's some really interesting information here about organic land care, using non-toxic um, methods or organic methods. What you put on your property um, is, will give you an idea of what will show up. And if you put toxic chemicals on your property, we all know that that's not a good thing. And the story that uh, David wanted me to share with you was one that I had with a neighbor who um, was comparing her peonies to my peonies, because <laughs> my peonies were open and hers refused to open. So she asked me to come over and look at her peonies, why they were not opening. And I said, Patty, you have no ants on your peonies. And she said, of course I have no ants. <laughs> I have just had my property sprayed, so there are no ants. I said, well, then your peonies will not open. And she's a biology major, too. So I said, if you don't have the ants, they can't protect the buds, and the buds will not open. So they actually keep other predator um, insects away from the buds. They also lick off what is like the, um, the coating, and the flowers will open. So she just basically created um, an environment that was not going to allow her peonies to open. But you think of the impact the other, mm -hmm. you know, in the environment of her backyard. So um, there's a phrase that you should remember that pe peonies and ants are like peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> they always go together. Uh, if you don't have one, you don't, the others don't open. So these are the kind of little um, anecdotes and stories that we have in our gardens and in our neighborhoods. So I think when we ha do an, ac an action that is bad, we're going to influence our property and we're going to influence that pocket or that corridor, that moving sidewalk from one corridor to another. So um, this is why Aspertuck is just doing such wonderful things, not only with the large scale conservation, but with stewardship. So I really encourage you to take home uh, some plants and some information and, you know, make your own crossing in the pollinator pathway and on the green corridor. So I'm looking forward to the hike today and we've got such a beautiful day. So thank you for letting me share the story with you. Thanks, Mel. Okay. Uh, one other person that I'd like to introduce and then we'll go on our hike. We're just going to walk down the street to the entrance to Honey Hill. I do have some maps for everybody uh, who are going on the hike. Um, is Matt Bartelme of Bart's Tree Service. Um, Matt is a member of Aspetuck Land Trust. Well, and well, Matt owns this company, is, uh, I think up in Danbury, is that right, Matt? And he does a lot of work around here, and he does a lot of pro bono work for Aspetuck Land Trust. Um, so he does great work. This is a plug for Bart's Tree Service. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I just want to thank you, Matt, for all you do. All right. He well, grew up on this property. And that's right, and that's what I want to say. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, his father was a caretaker for this property oh. many years ago, and he grew up here oh, wow. and wandering this land, and they lived right there. Um, so he just reintroduced himself to Barbara, and Barbara hardly recognized him because the last time she saw him, he was about this tall. Yeah. <laughs> so it's all about the people. So thank you guys for, for your support. And who's not going on the hike? All right. Okay, well, most everybody is. That's great. Well, with that, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Anthony. Uh, I've got about 20 maps, so uh, maybe we can just kind of share them. And we'll take a little walk through our Honey Hill Preserve, which we originally started to preserve in the, in the, in the 1960s. And through a variety of acquisitions, we've created over a 100-acre open space. So we're just going to hike a portion of it. But you can go to our website to see the whole shebang, uh, and it's on the map as well. How long do you think the hike will take? Hike is probably going to take, I would say, an hour. 
Southwestern Connecticut, especially, is um, the deer overgrazing, deer overpopulation and grazing. They do, they do have an impact on the land when the populations are out of balance, they overeat, and uh, you know, you, you, you tend to find the same types of plants, you know, time after time after again, with all these parcels you look at because there's the things that the deer don't like to eat, right? Yeah. Um, and then the other threat being an invasive species. And so, as we came in from the road there, wherever you have areas where soil has been disturbed, it, it uh, generates, it, it disrupts the soil profile and it makes kind of like this homogenous mix. So that old road there that had a history of some soil disturbance, soil compaction, you know, there may have been some, some gravel brought in for the old road or something. And, um, and then you have residential areas, people planting things that are not native. And um, that, that serves as the uh, point of invasion for, for these invasive species. And um, so uh, one, one of the species in particular that we know is the winged euonymus. And it's a, it's a very common shrub. People call it burning bush. Mm -hmm. And it's because in the fall it turns a deep red mm -hmm. color and, and it looks beautiful. But it has very low uh, value to wildlife. Uh, birds may nest in it, but, and they may eat the, the, the fruit from it. But just because they're eating the fruit doesn't mean it's good for them because they haven't evolved uh, with that species. It's a mineral soil. Now, if you have like compost pile, and if you had earthworms in there, and if you had enough earthworms, you'd, they'd be eating all of your organic matter and your compost, and their the, their poop that they leave behind is mineral. And that's, that that process is called mineralization. We take organic soil and turn it into mineral soil. Okay. Um, so when you have this uh, accumulation of organic soil, it doesn't break down because it's saturated and there's no oxygen and therefore you don't have the organisms breaking it down, it'll start to accumulate. And so that's one way to tell a wetland is when you have um, these uh, organic soils. Uh, if you go in the upland and you look at the soil and you take a fistful and you squeeze it, it's not going to lose through your fingers. It's mineral soil, so it's just going to remain hard.